My name is Jen MacArthur. I am one of the faculty members here in the Department of Architectural Science, and it is my great pleasure to introduce all of you tonight to James Timberlake's lecture, which is entitled Fullness, and I don't want to give away too much about it. Before we get into things, I'd like to acknowledge the Canadian Institute of Steel Construction, who generously sponsored this event. Without them, lectures like this would never happen, so thank you very much. I'd also like to take a second to acknowledge that we are currently on unceded Aboriginal land. We're in the Dish with One Spoon territory, which is a treaty between the Haudenosaunee, or sorry, the Haudenosaunee and the Mississauga Nation. The Dish with One Spoon was an idea of, that the First Nations tribes had that all of the collective lands around the villages were to be shared, and they were to be shared with everybody. So anybody from any tribe was always welcome. It represented a spirit of sharing and invitation. And when the colonists came to Canada, that same invitation was extended to share the land. In that spirit, I'd like to invite you to share the space with us tonight. So James Timberlake's work, James is a partner in the firm here in Timberlake, reflects their belief in beautifully crafted, thoughtfully made buildings, holistically integrated to site, program, and people. Examples include the Melvin J. and Claire Levine Hall at the University of Pennsylvania, which employs the first actively ventilated curtain wall of its type in North America. Smart Wrap, a mass customizable building envelope exhibited at the Cooper, Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum. Cellophane House, a fully recyclable energy gathering dwelling exhibited at the, Modern, the Museum of Modern Art in New York and the US Embassy in London, which employs strategies to significantly reduce energy consumption and sets an agenda for carbon neutrality. Under his guidance, the firm has received over 200 design citations, including the AIA Firm Award in 2008 and the Cooper Hewitt National Design Award in 2010. James and, Stephen, James and partner Stephen Kieran were the inaugural recipients of the Benjamin Latrobe Fellowship for Architectural Design Research from the AIA College of Fellows in 2001. Since 2002, they have co-authored seven books on architecture, including a new book called Alluvium, Dhaka, Bangladesh, in the Crossroads of Water, which was released in 2015. In addition to his architectural practice, James has held visiting professorships at the University of Washington, Yale University, the University of Michigan, and the University of Texas at Austin, amongst other institutions. And in 2012, he was appointed by the Obama administration to serve on the board of the National Institute of Building Sciences. Without further ado, I'd like to give the stage to James and thank him so much for coming. Thank you, Jen. Thank you very much. Is the mic, is the mic on? Can you, can you all hear me in the back? Awesome. First of all, uh, I love coming up here. Toronto is one of my favorite places, and Canada is just a place that I always enjoy coming back to, and I, I, I appreciate your welcome to me here. Um, we are doing a building over at UT, uh, UT Mississauga, and uh, that goes under construction, hopefully uh, starting this spring. So we're excited that finally, after a couple of projects here, one, one of which that didn't go forward um, uh, in Calgary, uh, that we're finally doing a project here in Canada. So I'm excited to be up here uh, more often, and it's great to see some friends and uh, uh, known faculty in the, in, the, in, the, in the audience as well. Um, I just want to acknowledge um, being here tonight that I probably wouldn't be here tonight um, except for obviously, you know, work and resume and all of that, except for uh, the late Ian McBurney, who was a professor here, a good friend of mine, um, and uh, I hold dear in my heart, um, and I was sorry I was not able to be here for his, uh, his memorial service, but um, he's with us, you know, all the time. And uh, he was always somebody who um, was there pushing my buttons. Um, and so uh, I think he's here tonight uh, doing that as well. I know that given the current political circumstances in, in uh, the United States, that um, he would certainly be uh, one of the more uh, vocal uh, of, of, of all of you and all of us um, about trying to right that ship um, uh, that we're currently uh, uh, suffering uh, in the United States right now. But we'll get over it. And uh, uh, if the 
election doesn't turn out uh, the way I hope it does next year, then I, I might move up here. You know, so. <laughs> uh, without further ado, um, uh, the lecture is entitled Fullness, and you'll understand why in just a moment. And I am going to take you through about an hour's worth of work uh, here. So um, I know it's um, almost Thanksgiving, Canadian Thanksgiving. I know it's reading week. I know you're in the middle of presentations and all of that. But just take a moment and take a deep breath and enjoy uh, you know, the 59 minutes that are left. Um, and we'll have a Q&A as well. Um, I, I won't belabor this, but these are some of the books that we've written and some of the awards that we've won. Uh, you know, Karen Timberlake is a firm of about 105 people. Uh, we have six partners, um, and uh, we work all over the world. We, you know, we'll talk a little bit about the new US Embassy in London toward the end of the lecture. So this is why this lecture is called Fullness. Um, this is our latest book. Uh, it's available through Monticelli Press. I'm not here to sell books, but I'm very excited about this. It's in two, two parts. Um, the first part is called All In, and the second part is called In All. And the two pieces really unpack the last nine to 10 years worth of some of our more major projects, including uh, a couple of the houses that I'll show here, uh, including the embassy. Um, but it dives deeply into why we think um, architecture uh, is made up of um, a holistic, is a holistic entity, made up of everything. When I was in school back in the 1970s, um, you know, uh, the narrative was, oh, in order to become a designer, you, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll concern yourself with consultants that'll take care of all the dirty work mechanically and structurally and you know acoustically and everything else and you just focus on you know the elevations and the plan and everything will turn out okay well I knew then that that wasn't the case and ha having worked for Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown um, having worked for Lewis Sauer having worked for a number of other architects um, and then starting our own firm you know this is not how we practice we practice um, all in, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So this is just a kind of an array of some of the things that we do, uh, including embedding research uh, deeply in our, uh, into our work. You know, we have a 15-person interdisciplinary team of researchers in our office that help us um, think through softwares, hardwares, um, you know, new technologies, ways of building, ways of thinking. They're deeply embedded in all of our, our teams, and they help us think through uh, some of the things that we're trying to get to deeply. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So this is really all in here. You know, this is just, you know, but about 100 uh, of the things that you think about when you start talking about architecture. And back in the day, you know, one of those bubbles might have been design. The other one might have been, you know, um, you know, people, maybe, you know, if people, if architects were thinking about people, but, you know, there's a lot of things up here, including money, including uh, the environment, including materiality and other things that, you know, that make up architecture. And you are in the wonderful position as students and faculty of trying to think about ways of integrating all of that into your work and making that you know, truly, um, you know, truly a sustainable outcome, you know, for the future. We're ISO certified. So what does that mean? You know, we, we get audited uh, every three years. We, you know, we are reviewed every year. We plan, we do, we monitor, we learn. We design, innovate, and invent, you know, in that kind of cycle. So we're constantly looking to improve ourselves. This is kind of the, um, international version of Kaizen, you know, uh, continuous improvement. Um, and we've mapped 55 processes in our office and we continue to discover more. Um, and those processes are constantly looked for and evaluated for improvement. Um, what it, that helps us do is design. You know, we had, a, we had an, uh, a staff person when we first rolled this out about uh, 15 years ago, come up to me and said, 
This is going to ruin the culture of the firm. This is going to change forever, Karen Timberlake. It's going to, it's going to make a mess out of this place. And within about eight months, you know, he was out um, you know, working for somebody else. Not because I asked him to leave. I said, hey, play, play with us. You know, let's see how this works out. In fact, by mapping our processes, knowing what we can do and when we do them and what order to do them in and how to continuously improve it, it helps us improve our design work. It helps QA and QC. It helps improve getting deeper you know, into the kind of sustainable and environmental ethical things that we, that we like to do. And so these are just some of the questions that are asked on a daily basis, you know, thousands over the years. You know, uh, imparted through the, you know, the uh, construct of the office. This image is laid over our office, a 60,000 square foot building, a former um, brewery bottling plant in Philadelphia. We occupy two of those floors. The downstairs is uh, storage, uh, off-street parking, bicycle parking, uh, fitness space, and all of that. And the other two floors are making spaces and places for design as well. And these are just some of the things that we do. You know, one of the questions asked of me to talk about in this lecture was to talk a little bit about how the embassy came about and some of the things that we do. This is not unlike the war room that we set up for the embassy competition and then the first phases of design. But this particular uh, session that you're seeing here and some of the models that are being made and the mock-ups that are made in our shop um, are, is being done for a very large project um, in lower Manhattan for NYU. It's uh, 750,000 square feet of space, um, 30 stories tall, uh, 55 classrooms, three theaters, uh, athletics and recreation space, student housing and faculty housing, all in a mixed-use academic platform. And so, you know, we began that project, you know, with the team all coalesced, uh, working together, pinning things up, iterating, uh, editing, um, and then evaluating, and then getting ready to present those to the client. This is a, this is a, a session um, during the embassy competition uh, with some of the major players, including Lori Olin on the left there, um, uh, and my partner, Stephen Kieran and two of my uh, newest, latest partners there, Richard Maiman and Matt Crystal as well, um, all working uh, on the initial phases of the competition for that. On the backboard, you'll see uh, some of the um, cultural uh, uh, inputs that we gathered over the course of uh, the competition phase, from art to architecture to sculpture to painting to music that span the relationship between the US and the UK uh, that helped us begin to think about how that might influence the design of the building. So in fullness, you know, we unpack you know, some projects. And I'll just quickly take you through a couple of these. High Horse Ranch in uh, Northern California, uh, you know, project that was offsite constructed to about 60% um, wood. Uh, wood structure placed on the uh, ridge of a mountain, um, uh, you know, with uh, expansive uh, walls that open up to breezes that we spent eight months mapping, putting a, uh, you know, a weather station up on top of the ridge and mapping, uh, you know, the prevailing breezes and uh, uh, temperatures on that ridge line and understanding how to orient the house and how to capture uh, and utilize uh, that. So this has got a 45-mile view on a clear day to the, south, uh, to the southeast. The Willits Fire in Northern California, about three hours north of, of uh, San Francisco, came to the base of this mountain. Um, uh, Cal Fire camped out right at this house. They had just moved in uh, to this house and uh, fought the fire down in the Willits Valley there. Um, um, you would ask, well, why would then you do a wood house in a, in a, in a combustible, you know, region? Um, well, you know, you plan uh, for these kinds of things. One of the things that we did with this particular house was um, <clears throat> the property was a former cannabis farm 
illegal. Um, it had been obviously uh, scattered hither and yon, and the uh, owners bought the 60 acres that draped down the mountainside on both sides. Um, there was a pond on the site. There was a 10,000 gallon reserve tank. Um, and what we talked the owner into was actually putting misting sprinklers around the ridge line of the roof, um, which obviously came in handy in this particular case um, because we were able to keep the area moist around there and use the, the tank and the pond for that. And of course, Cal Fire used those reserves as well. So here you see the modules. This is from the book, excerpt from the book, um, the modules coming up and then being lifted um, by crane onto the site. There are two small cabins on either side uh, of the main house. The main house is about just under 2,000 square feet. The cabins are about um, perched on the hillsides, um, about, uh, about 450 square feet apiece with a bathroom each. Um, and they just have expansive views. But what we unpack in all in and in all is the kind of beauty of the art of the projects. And then in the in all portion, uh, we unpack the sort of science and tectonics and the uh, research that went behind them. Likewise, at Pound Ridge in New York, um, another single family home that we, we completed not too long ago, uh, this um, a, a building uh, set between two rock outcroppings. This was a, um, uh, a reserve that the clients bought that had been unbuilt on and was not yet a reserve. But what they did was they took three acres or four acres of that reserve and they assigned the rest of the 60 you know, to 100 acres off perpetually to um, a, a reserve so it will never be built on. It's third growth forest. It's also in an area that, um, uh, you know, uh, during the Revolutionary War, uh, the British and the U.S. kind of traipsed over. There are these giant rock outcroppings that the house nestles between and kind of perches between. Uh, you enter at the lower level in a kind of service uh, level, uh, come up through the vestibule uh, onto the main part of the house. And then the house is sips uh, setting, on, setting on the platform. The sips are then clad in uh, four polishes of stainless steel that set up, um, that are both um, set in and out um, so that we avoid bird strikes you know, on, the, on the house, uh, but set up a kind of reflectivity to the, to the forest and change, changes very much during the course of the light during the day and then, of course, uh, during the seasons as well. We built a mock-up out in the woods uh, to both show the, uh, the clients but also show the contractor what our intentions were uh, and then disassembled that. So we will talk a little bit about the US Embassy in just a moment, but I want to take you through how we got to the US Embassy a little bit, um, uh, both in terms of you know, choices of materiality and design. One of the things I think you could come to know about Kieran Timberlake is you know, while we experiment on a lot of things and while we investigate a lot of things and research a lot of things, we don't tend to throw a lot of things away. We tend to like to iterate. Um, and so um, you know, the embassy, you'll see, comes out of a, a kind of uh, oeuvre of work that we have been working on over a long period of time. Too often, I think, architects are kind of one and done. You know, they do something spectacular and say, look how great we are, um, and uh, look how spectacular the building is, and then the building is either a fail because you know it's got issues. They didn't research it properly. It doesn't. Uh, it doesn't weather properly. It doesn't you know environmentally perform properly or whatever. Um, I think one of the things that we've always prided ourselves in being a little bit is in the tortoise and hare race. We're a little bit of the tortoise, less so the hare. You know, so we're not necessarily. Sometimes we're the first to some things. But we're, we're, not, we're not just racing ahead of everybody and then kind of evaporating. We're going to be there in the long term because some of, these, some of these projects just continue on. So one of the projects that I want to talk about is SmartRap. 
And this was, this began back in 2004, came out of the work on the Latrobe Fellowship, um, you know, thinking a little bit about integrating technologies and also, uh, you know, um, uh, carbon cycle and some other kinds of things, um, thinking about materials that can be recycled and repurposed, um, but also things that where we could integrate technologies and think differently about uh, the building uh, wall relationship. And so we were, um, we were able to get the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum to allow us to do an exhibit up there. If you know anything about the National Design Museum, a lot of what their collection is about is about innovative materials and about you know, uh, inventions over the years about um, materials that have gotten into the, into the, into the, uh, into the um, construction stream um, and you know, have um, you know, uh, uh, worked over, over the years. And as you know, if you look at materiality over 500 years, it's a flat line, you know, just barely rising until you map it in about 20 or in 1932, if you will, and all of a sudden it starts to rise. And in about 19, in the middle of World War II, it go, almost goes vertically. And since that time, um, the line has almost totally changed trajectories from, you know, kind of, you know, a, a horizontal line of you know, natural materials that are, you know, taken from the earth um, that can be recycled but aren't necessarily, um, we haven't repurposed in the right way uh, over the years, to man-made invented materials that then find themselves into the work stream, some of which can be recycled and many of which are not and should be. Um, so this began to explore the whole notion of integrating photovoltaics and thin film batteries uh, and OLEDs on, um, on a thin film uh, fabric uh, that could be printed. Uh, and you know, we explored this and it ended up in Wired Magazine. We were uh, in the innovation sector of the Time Magazine back in the day and then had this, had this exhibit and it was up for about uh, five months, and what this was at the time was a, a PET substrate, which is a, a plastic, not unlike uh, plastic film, not unlike uh, you know what you see in water bottles and all of that. It had aerogel in it. It had phase change materials in it. It had o OLEDs and thin film batteries, all of which um, uh, could be organic. We think many of which could al already be. Or were either organic materials or could be organically printed on this substrate that then could be washed off and recycled. So the PET could be recovered. Uh, the aluminum substrate of this, of this stru structure could be recovered. Um, and we could wash off the technology eventually um, and then recycle 98% um, of this. And this, this was, my son is now, 21 years old, and he hates it when I show this picture, but I, I, I love him to death, and uh, I love this picture of him, of him looking out through that wall. And I always, I always ask myself the question when I see this picture, is he looking out to the future or is he looking out to the past? Because I was taking his picture. So, you know, it's always one of these uh, uh, images of, of a dichotomy. But here you see the batteries and the thin film of photovoltaics. Um, and the OLEDs at the lower right-hand corner. And those OLEDs at the time were, you know, a half inch by, uh, I turned this off, but they were a half inch by, by half inch. They were smaller than my iWatch, you know, which is an OLED here. Um, and certainly, you know, way smaller than many of your massive phones and iPads and everything else. And certainly way smaller than what the um, Samsung uh, and LG screens are now, which are about the size of this, this screen on the wall, um, and all made of thin film OLED uh, materials. Cellophane House then built upon that. We were invited by uh, the Museum of Modern Art in 2008 to contribute a project. Um, we were initially asked, and 800 uh, firms around the world responded. They whittled that down to 400, asked us each for a proposal. We submitted a proposal. They selected ours along with five other houses. 
um, to submit to a site that was adjacent to Todd Williams and Billy Shen's uh, American uh, uh, Craft Museum um, that has now been replaced by MoMA and the um, uh, Perot Tower uh, in New York, um, um, uh, Jean Nouvel Tower in New York uh, between 53rd and 54th Street. And so we have been working a lot on offsite construction and refabricating architecture had been the underpinning of all of that. And we really wanted to kind of get people to think differently about offsite construction from just being, you know, kind of trailer sized cubes that got stacked to being something that could be quite innovative and uh, unique. And so um, here's Cellophane House on site at the opening, CBS Tower uh, behind it by Saren, and, um, you know, a four story stack of light framed aluminum uh, modules that are now wrapped with smart wrap, thin film, photovoltaics, now layered up into five layers so that we have a passive wall, learning from Levin Hall, the active wall, a passive wall that the air is passing between those layers of uh, ETFE in this particular case, drawing up through the house in Manhattan in July through October for nearly six months um, with sensors in the house because when people looked at smart wrap, they said, oh, they couldn't possibly wrap a building with that stuff. They couldn't possibly make a, you know, a space that could be lived in. And so one of the things that Ian knew and other people in this, in this, in this, that know us and know me in this, in this room know, that if you go, you can't do something, you're, you're bound, you, 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 you're probably poking the wrong person because we're kind of bound and determined to figure out a way around that you can't. Um, and in this particular case, you know, one of the things that we took on was trying to get an occupiable space, you know, that could, you know, that could be um, lived in, um, you know, uh, presented as part of this, this house. And so on the back side, on the right hand image, are, um, are photo BIPVs, photovoltaics embedded in glass back there on the south side of the wall oriented the right way so we were taking advantage of the light through the canyon of New York um, on the site um, and uh, accessible to you know, people going in. So you know, what we're exploring there is really not about construction any longer. You know, we finally got to a point where in refabricating architecture we were asking about construction versus assembly and this is an image from that. Here, Construction being things that are nailed and glued and wasted and thrown away and you know high waste stream you know volume to something that is precise you know BIM imagined uh, envisioned uh, failed early and failed fast on um, and pre-assembled and then you know uh, brought out um, you know to the site and with a high uh, recycle stream so. You know, thinking about how all of that goes together asks us to also do a different kind of design, which is design the logistics of how all of this goes together. Who's supplying what? When it's getting there? Who's fabricating that? Who's bringing it together? Who's overseeing it? And so this isn't unlike the way a car is assembled in a way of tier one and tier two uh, suppliers, but having those two streams you know, coalesce uh, in just in time on site. One of the things that we took on on that particular project beyond embedding the sensors in the walls and understanding how those walls performed, um, naturally ventilating that building, uh, you know, was looking at the total embodied energy and the percent that we, were, we could recover uh, and the embodied energy that we could recover in that particular building. And by the right choices of materials, and the right choices of, you know, of thinking about recycling streams and all of that, we were able to get to about a 98% recovery on this particular building, assuming that, you know, the aluminum either went back into that recycle stream or the ETFE did, or that the, the house itself was repurposed uh, in, in, it, in its entirety. And the only things that uh, ultimately that we would have to grind up and probably repurpose but wouldn't end up in that one and a half percent or 
2% realm was the, the polycarbonate on the floors that allowed us to get the daylight through down through the house. So this is how it went together, series of kind of um, tables and then um, bridge pieces that, um, um, that then were uh, assembled on site. Uh, and they went together in this way. And we you know, imagined it uh, not only in the BIM, but also in our shop, you know, had all the pieces mapped so they were precisely cut. Um, and then uh, tested how we would assemble the ETFE in the frame um, and get air up through it. This was all in our office back uh, in uh, 2007, 2008. That's uh, one of our interns standing on the, on the ETFE there, uh, jumping up and down on it to do our 150 pound test. You know, I don't know why they chose him to do that. Um, <laughs> Here's, here's um, the, uh, ta the table sets with the polycarbonate floors and the aluminum frames being assembled in New Jersey at Coleman's factory. Um, they were then shipped out uh, to New York through the tunnel on low boys. Um, we designed these moment connections. So, you know, aluminum isn't real great in moment in twisting, you know, torquing, you know, it can tear. Um, so we had to, we added these steel um, uh, bespoke pieces that allowed us to tie the joints together uh, and diagonalize those forces um, through the frame. So this is it going together in New York. 85% um, of the house was delivered and assembled in six days. And the last 15% of the house was delivered um, and, uh, and finished in the, in, 15, in the next 15 days. So over 21 days, this house was completely put in place. And you see the panels going up, kitchen going in, the lights going on. Um, and this was a view inside uh, during the course of the exhibit, polycarbonate floors, abundant natural light flowing down through the house, um, you know, views in and out, you know, uh, full kitchen, full baths, um, and it's sitting next to um, uh, Todd and Billy's building, both of which now are uh, gone. One thrown away, the other one stored, and parts of it are being reused. So um, I, I love showing this because it reminds me of, of, the, of the book Little House, you know, where the the house is built out in the countryside, but then the urbanism kind of comes in around the little house. Uh, one of my favorite books reading to my children back in the day. Um, but now this is filled in by a giant tower. So that factored into our thinking about the embassy, as did you know, urbanism like you know, this uh, um, subway stop in Philadelphia, a new urban park outside of uh, City Hall. Uh, at the crossroads of the city, uh, Broad and Market Street, um, uh, designed uh, with Olin, uh, our landscape architects, uh, changing the nature of that west porch of, the, of City Hall from two giant holes that were put in during the bicentennial in 1976, but a, a kind of cavernous um, uh, outdoor space that nobody felt comfortable, you know, being in uh, and, and needed to be replaced. And instead, we, we replaced it with an interactive uh, park and fountain um, that's used year-round and programmed throughout the year, a cafe and transit entry, and then two glass pavilions that lead down to the subway. This is all laminated glass. It's all st structural glass. There are no uh, uh, kit or fittings, uh, structural uh, silicone sealant, uh, putting these pieces together. Here you see the, um, the glass uh, being lifted into place um, for the roof going over the, the top of the um, uh, entrance uh, canopy. So it's five layers of glass, low iron, um, you know, very clear. Um, uh, set in an arc, and that arc was set urbanistically at the top of Billy Penn's hat at the top of the tower, so it's tied into that whole, uh, you know, that whole kind of urban uh, statement there. I'm not gonna go through that whole video 
there, but this is the outcome, are these very you know, tight joints, very clear um, relationships of pieces, uh, you know, structural uh, glass walls and spanning uh, glass uh, ceilings. The fountain uh, by the artist Eshelman, you know, uh, has colored lights and uh, misting sprays that come up. In the wintertime, they turn that into an ice skating rink. Um, they show movies on the lawn. Uh, they don't ride their bikes down the stairwells. Um, Lloyd. <laughs> um, but they, uh, you know, it is uh, an intermodal spot uh, on, the, on the campus. And before we did this, you know, people would scuttle out of the subway system in Philadelphia kind of with this grimace on their face and it's kind of gray and, you know, um, if you've been to Philadelphia, there are beautiful days like Toronto and then there are some really gray days and really grim days, but coming out of the subway, they always seem grim. Now, you know, with the light falling into the subway, you know, uh, you know with these cascade of stairs, you're invited out into the park. People walk in and out of that space, you know, with smiles on their faces, totally transformed this whole area of Philadelphia. It's become the kind of face of Philadelphia when we're on the news uh, um, during the course of, you know, world events when Philadelphia is in the news. Another one of these uh, influences on the, on the embassy was the Eg Edgar Putman Pavilion at, at the Michener Art Museum. And, um, you know, it, it uh, you know, clearly was an opportunity that the museum came to us and said, we want an event space, we want to be able to show sculpture, we want to do some other things and have lectures, but we want you to just stick this, you know, room down in the corner of the, corner of the, the museum um, at the end of a long linear uh, landscape park that, um, uh, that, uh, you know, was on the edge of the museum. The museum is set up by a head house and a, 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 the remaining 25-foot stone wall of a, of a 19th century uh, Pennsylvania prison. And that prison wall is just, you'll see it in a minute, it's just a gorgeous rubble wall that uh, stands there and stands aside as a kind of silent sentinel to the to the park outside. When we saw it, we said this park is not being used. What if we put the room in the middle of the landscape, make two outdoor rooms that are connected through the room, and you're able to get to it on either side of the room, um, and, but you're able to see the landscape all the way through, and then create a clear glass pavilion. Um, the the uh, stone wall side of the building is north, the south side of the building is backed up against the existing building, so a lot of the energy on this particular building is absorbed by the existing spaces already. We have a modest uh, footprint on the east and a modest footprint on the west due to the you know, uh, uh, setting sun, but for the most part, we again could think about 24 uh, foot high pieces of structural laminated glass self, you know, self um, supporting um, that just creates this very glass open pavilion, uh, this very serene room, uh, you know, in conversation with the stone wall uh, next to it. Um, and at the dedication, I, 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 I said, you know, when we were thinking about this, I, I often had in my own mind the conversation that the stone wall, in a kind of Kanyan way, uh, with all due respects to Lucan. Um, you know, in a kind of Kanyan way, how the stone wall, when this building is done, how the stone wall might be in conversation with the glass wall, si you know, that they're sitting only eight feet apart. And so, you know, it's just sit it sits on these very thin um, blades of um, uh, c these, these steel column, columns that are um, uh, very thin, uh, bespoke, um, uh, you know, uh, slender columns that uh, the roof ties the kind of moment together of the tabletop in this particular case and allows the glass to just form a membrane around the whole surface. So, you know, again, trying to press the details of 
how doors can be placed in old glass wall and still be quite minimal and weather stripped, how the acoustics of the space and so forth might work. And here's that conversation corridor, if you will. You can move from one side of the garden to the other. Um, this is about an eight foot passage um, and move between the 19th century and the 21st century on either side. So without further ado, the reason I was asked to come here was to talk about this building and I want to unpack it for you. And the reason why I didn't come last year was we were still working on a lot of photography and I really felt that at this time, a year later, we would really have that photography. It's been open for about 20 months. I've been back uh, three times since it's opened. I was just there about three weeks ago. Um, and I, I want to take you through uh, how we got to this scheme um, and how, you know, some of the thinking behind it um, and just kind of set it up through some of the images along the Thames, uh, you know, with Wandsworth growing uh, in around uh, the embassy on either side. Nine Elms Lane in the foreground, the Thames on the right. Uh, it sits in a four and a half acre park uh, connected to a linear park that was part of the overall planning of the six developments, uh, working with the Greater London Authority and others um, you know, to tie this deeply into the urban fabric of the building. And I'll talk more about the exterior and the interior in a minute. So, how did we get here? How did the United States get to that particular place? In about, two, in about uh, the late 1990s, under the Clinton administration, this particular building, designed by Aero Saarinen, uh, won it also by competition by Aero Saarinen. Here you see it open in about 1963 with the street open in front. Um, you know, I remember bounding up those steps in 1976 when I went to London with my passport in hand, you know, saying hello to the Marine Guard right at the door, going right up into the lobby and being able to talk to anybody I wanted to talk to in that particular building. So we get to 1998 and we get to Dar es Salaam and we get to Nairobi and we get to two embassy bombings in Africa. Um, you know, where diplomats and visitors are killed. And the next step, you know, by our government was we need to, you know, not necessarily harden, but reinforce the access to these buildings. So fences go up, the street is closed, and you'll see this in a minute. Uh, pavilions go up, access pavilions go up, and layers of security are added. And that's not unlike many of the embassies around the world, Canadian embassies, the UK embassies, you know, many of the Western embassies are this way, as are Russia's and China's and many of the others at this particular point. These diplomatic missions are there to serve, you know, our countries. Um, I believe deeply in the foreign service and the state departments of our countries. Uh, and I think they're, they're noble missions. Um, but they are now, you know, become targets. And so that kind of innocent moment that you're seeing in that, in that 1960s shot is replaced then by the left-hand shot there of two pavilions added in the, in the 2000s. Um, bollards, uh, a ring of bollards all the way around the building. Um, you know, uh, the distances across the street on the east and west sides of this um, you know, were quite narrow to the residential properties on either side. And of course, it faced Grosvenor Square and Mayfair, um, which had the Canadian embassy around it um, across the street. Um, it was the headquarters of the Allies during World War II. Uh, so there was a, a naval building there that um, was owned by the US that had been the headquarters of the uh, Western Command. Uh, but, you know, headquartered by Eisenhower uh, there um, and uh, shared by the Canadians and the UK and the rest of the ANZAC alliance as well. Um, and, um, you know, the embassy then uh, was given, you know, to a leased property to be on that site in 1960 that Saarinen designed for roughly 200 people to occupy 
and about 100 visitors per day um, you know, going through it. Well, by <coughs> the year 2000, there were 600 people working in that building with one air change per hour. It would make the pit seem absolutely pleasant by comparison. Um, you know, in terms of uh, the airflow and everything else. I, I know a little bit about this. I've lectured here at least once before. <laughs> um, uh, so, you know, it, it was stifling. You know, air, air changes per hour, one air change per hour is just absolutely asphyxiating, particularly when you have 600 people in the, in the building, a sealed up building. And the visitors per day during peak demands were up to 1,000 visitors per day. So you can imagine the chaos. You know, lines outside, the park pushed back. Uh, um, the embassy effect on Mayfair and Grosvenor Square being um, changing the, the nature of uh, the value of the properties around there to being some of the most expensive in the world. And um, so several planning studies were done, and they looked at renovating this building, and they decided they would look for a different site. They looked at 47 different sites around London, four within the congestion zone, all the rest outside of that. Uh, they settled on the, on the site in Wandsworth between Vauxhall and Battersea on the south side of, of the Thames, and then decided to ask for qualifications. So they got qualifications. We had to be um, American architects doing an American embassy because ultimately we had to be um, um, uh, cleared uh, through our governmental clearance. Um, 39 architecture firms submitted. They whittled that down to 12. They interviewed 12. They whittled that back down to four. They gave each of the firms um, uh, some money to do a competition. And the four firms were uh, Paycob Freed, uh, Richard Myron Partners, Morphosis, and ourselves. So four generations of firms uh, looking at this problem unpacking a brief that stood a uh, single-sided paper out of the copier about three and a half feet tall. It was very detailed, down to closets and what would go into a closet um, in this particular building. We began by, you know, we begin all our projects by, you know, creating goals for that project internally, but then we share those goals with our clients and we modify them if the, if the client, you know, wishes to share them. So we created these goals during the course of uh, the competition, while we were doing the competition entry. Um, eight goals from diplomacy through environment to security and workplace, um, and you can read them. Um, but they, you know, essentially we envisioned uh, a building that was not only an environment for diplomacy, but also uh, a, a diplomat of the environment. And so we were trying to get a very high performing building that then could serve the US government 60 to 100 years or longer, be highly flexible, um, but then um, also respect British culture and context and meet all the security demands on the, on the, on the, on the site. So you can imagine Wandsworth, four and a half acres, you start thinking about massing up this building, <clears throat> and you realize that site's pretty small. Um, and it's faced by the river, a rail line behind it, in a post-industrial site that 500 years ago, ago as Crown Land was um, uh, hunting grounds, uh, then became agricultural land, uh, then eventually became part of the port of uh, the Thames, then became uh, industrial land that was heavily bombed during World War II, uh, and then became post-industrial land with logistics companies like UPS and DHL and Royal Mail, and then the large six-building uh, uh, warehouse-like building beyond the railway there in the, in the middle ground um, is Covent Garden Market, where the flower market of London uh, is, and so still in the midst of, of London. So MI5 is down, or MI6 is down. You've probably seen Skyfall when you know, they blow up uh, the MI6 coming across the bridge down. Well, that's down there. Um, and no, the embassy wasn't put there because MI6 is there. And no, there aren't any tunnels under the building. So we'll get that out of the way. So that's what it was going to turn into. 
right? Um, the last largest development site, literally in the confines of Greater London, post the Olympic Village, you know, of uh, 2012, was this site. And Wandsworth was desperate for this. You know, one of the one of the poorer boroughs, if you will, was desperate to get you know um, development on this post-industrial land. So. Battersea Power Station down at the right, um, uh, you know, Pink Floyd's another brick in the wall, you remember that? Um, that was, you know, broadcast on the side of that particular, uh, uh, that particular power plant. What is now going to be the headquarters of Apple and Microsoft and uh, other office spaces with major apartments all the way around it, designed by Foster and Gary and others. Um, Richard Rogers, Fosters, SOM, many other architects all involved in these projects here. Nearly 20,000 new apartments in this whole complex. The taller structures are um, because the view shed from the um, uh, Houses of Parliament upriver, kind of in our foreground but off the screen. Um, aren't affected by those, those, those particular buildings, whereas the lower buildings, including our embassy, were in the view shed of all of that and protected by uh, English heritage. So we had to take that into consideration, ergo why we didn't have a taller building, uh, ergo why we had to you know, get a, 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 an efficient form. So here was the planning uh, uh, region during the course of the competition. We knew these other five developments being planned, emerging. Um, we had some coordination meetings with them, both one during the competition, then several, you know, many after uh, the competition. But you can see the four and a half acres in the middle of that, you know, of that linear park between the parallel lines of the Thames, Nine Elms Lane, a high street, high speed traffic that they were trying to traffic calm and, and uh, you know, bring back into a neighborhood. And the, and the uh, railroad viaduct, this green line that went between Vauxhall and Battersea over here, you know, gave a place for you know, uh, pedestrians and bikers to do so in a, in a confined and protected environment and allow all these apartments to you know, come out into open space as well. So this four and a half acres became this opportunity of a kind of jewel in the necklace, if you will. And how we began to think about kind of winding all those strands together, <clears throat> making connections of, of this building into the urban fabric, but trying to tie it in to uh, these other you know, um, uh, modal streams. The bridge across the River Thames is proposed. It hasn't been built yet, a pedestrian and bike bridge from Pimlico over uh, to the embassy. Um, but you know these four streams all being stranded together and two new tube stops on the northern line being proposed, five minute walk to the east and a five minute walk to the west of the embassy uh, made this an ideal site. So that view shed going from the Houses of Parliament set on that four and a half acres, set up this restriction of height, you know, of how big uh, and bulky and high a building uh, we, could, we could meet. And we were bound and determined to meet that requirement because, you know, we felt that our competition scheme should carry forward from the competition, that should, we shouldn't just win a competition and then redesign the building afterwards. We should win it on the merits. Um, and so we, we met every aspect of their brief uh, and their programmatic element in, in, in doing this. And we, we would test the billing in terms of its height and its width and its, and its mass. And I'll talk about the form in just a minute. And it, the moment it would leak out of that, that iceberg, we called it, you know, we, ha we had to you know, kind of iterate the design to bring it back in. The cube, um, I'll talk a little bit about how it, it formed, but uh, the cube was picked both inside and outside as a very efficient form, a Pythagorean form, you know, uh, set in history, not an invented form. There, as you, for all of you who've been to the UK and London, you know there's a myriad of invented forms all over that city. And you have to ask yourself as an architect going into London, 
how do you design a building in that particular place and have it be respected, serene, stand out, but meet the mission of what you're doing without it turning into the walkie-talkie or you know, something else. Um, and so you know, we settled on this cube, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this, but also set up the proportionality of this cube and carried that golden section into a lot of the divisions of the proportionality carried throughout the building because we wanted this to be timeless. So the divisions on the outside of the glass and down through the lobby and in through the plan of the building were carried forward. So in that competition war room, these are the, some of the images that we, that we had up on that backboard that you saw us working around. Um, you know, shared images from the UK and the US. We've had this shared history going back and forth in architecture and landscape, plants, fauna, you know, um, flora, um, you know, uh, history, culture, all of that. Um, deeply connected, um, you know, and we wanted to understand that, you know, so that, you know, we could bring, you know, some of that into uh, the making of this building. Likewise, we knew we had to have a, a hard shell to this building. Um, and, but we also needed that hard shell to be environmentally, you know, sustainable um, and, you know, uh, 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 participate in the environmental um, profile of the building. Um, and the daylight factor was a, you know, th this is basically an office building, and I know you'll laugh, but um, it's basically an office building. And from the glass face to the core is 15 meters, roughly 45 feet, which is the ideal uh, distance for office daylighting, you know, established in Europe many, many years ago. Uh, used in Canada in many buildings in the UK. And we established it here with a central core um, and then these trays of space around the cube, um, you know, um, uh, uh, with, you know, glass walls that allow that natural daylight to come in, allow us to turn the lights off. But then we had to deal with glare and we had to deal with the energy on that glass. And so we started thinking about the glass being kind of the hard layer and a soft layer being the thing that would give um, us form and also potentially gather additional energy. And we took that through a variety of iterative um, you know, strategies um, from goofy to not so goofy uh, to well-worn current structural tropes to uh, not so well-worn structural tropes that are now becoming well-worn. Um, but the more important piece of the cube was when we did the environmental profiling of uh, about 45 forms on this particular site, one of the things that we noticed was the cube at the lower right um, and the lower left, um, depending on its width and breadth and height, really performed the best, particularly if we oriented the cube due north, south, east, and west, and allowed uh, in, in London, and allowed that sun to come around, and then protected the east, west, and south uh, facades with a, some glare control shading, um, but also allowed us then to, um, rather than artificially turn that cube in the urban form, turn it because of performance against all the other graining that was following the river. And we did, we have developed a lot of tools in our office for mapping um, solar gain, mapping glare, uh, interiors to the offices, uh, understanding the shading from ex uh, buildings around that. And then we started working with that outer uh, envelope. Um, so there was an inner envelope of glass and an outer envelope of ETFE that was set off of the frame of the building. And that became the construct of the, of the competition that was won. When we finally won the competition, then we went into a series of iterative studies, unpacking that science and making sure that we were failing early and failing fast on not only the form making of that, of that shade, but also the potential energy gathering of that shade as well, and looking at you know, the costing of those modules and the output of the PVs coming from the vertical walls as well as from the roof. And so as you can see, 
you know, we didn't pick just one kind of strand and call it a day. We spent probably 12 months uh, mocking up in small models, in virtual models, then larger models, then actually working with manufacturers to understand um, the different uh, 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 proportions and uh, relationships of that ETFE. It's a, it's a foil that can be stretched in tension to almost any form. Um, and so we found that the flare, you know, uh, making the kind of crystalline-like form and the thinning allowed us to open up the windows in the middle of the windows where we needed view out through the building and majority of light coming in, but then expand it at you know, just above the floor and below the floor um, in a place where we could not only en energy gather, but also maximize the amount of energy kept off the building. The, f the ETFE was then um, had a frit added to it, a ceramic frit added to it, uh, that was gradated over the ETFE. And that's one of the things that gave it some of its light properties and its color properties that you'll see in the photography uh, going forward. All of that set off by an aluminum and uh, a steel horizontal strut from the curtain wall, a fairly standard curtain wall behind, laminated glass, um, but very clear uh, low iron glass uh, layered up. So all the while during the competition, we're mapping with Arup uh, and our consultants the energy profile of this building. Uh, the intention of this building is to be a net energy exporter. It has a CHP uh, 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 um, plant in the building. Uh, eventually, when they make that handshake with the neighborhood, um, that, that plant can give off energy to some of those additional buildings around that. And that was something that we worked out with the Greater London Authority as well. So the performative envelope you know, handles shading, energy production, daylighting, and thermal transmission. And I'll make a, I'll make a slight confession in just a moment. Um, and then we have a series of other operational things going on, including the pond, which gathers rainwater, allows us to irrigate the landscape, allows us to you know, cleanse that water and recycle all of that. And so you know, all of that was mapped in the total billing energy and the plug loads and the light loads and all of that um, to come to the, you know, the strategy that eventually, um, and we're measuring now, that this would be US lead platinum when the, uh, when the original brief was lead gold, um, and br but also meet the UK energy standards, low carbon standards of BREEM, um, and their, uh, their original brief standard was excellent, and we're trending toward outstanding uh, on that. So this building is what we said it was going to be, which was you know, a very high performance building. Now, there are two admissions to make. One is that Congress, in their infinite wisdom, uh, you know, got wind of the PVs on the vertical sides of the building back in the late phases of the Obama White House. Um, and as you know, back then, it was a GOP Congress on both sides of the House. Um, and they tortured uh, our, our, um, our overseers at OBO, at the Department of State, and tortured uh, uh, Hillary Clinton over uh, financial expenditures on the building. Uh, and eventually, the Department of State said, looked at the performance of the energy gathering on the ETFE uh, photovoltaic shields and decided to take those off the building for now. We have the capability of adding them back, um, but it was a way of you know, kind of making peace for the time. The, ener the uh, PV fields on the, on the uh, pavilions, entry pavilions, and on the roof of the embassy uh, provide for almost 80% of the solar being gathered on the project. So the walls were only adding an additional 20%. The second admission here is that we're still measuring this thing. 
And the CHP plant, we can't make that handshake yet with the uh, outside network yet because the US government hasn't worked out a handshake about how we can sell power. My view is give it away. Um, but I'm not in charge of the State Department. Um, but if you vote for me for president. <laughs> um, so anyway, we're still working that detail out. So those are the two admissions on the, on the energy profile side. So we did massive amounts of that kind of diagramming, but this is the kind of stair step. And the most important thing, particularly for students, but some of the faculty here as well, is this is where you begin when you start to design a building, at that baseline right there. And when you think about a building, you don't, the, most buildings, when you're handed a brief as architects, there's a certain energy profile that is embedded in that building until you challenge it. And that building has a deficit right from the get-go until you do something about that. And that embassy requirement deficit was about 10%. It was you know, more than you know, below zero here. And so we had to dig ourselves literally out of a hole. Um, you know, because the energy requirements of a sealed up building with four air changes per hour and the plug and light loads and all the other things that go on in an embassy, you realize um, that you have a pretty deep hole. So Arup and our, our consultants, um, you know, we had to get at least a 9% improvement just to achieve ASHRAE code minimum, you know, to get us back up to zero. So you can see the choices that are being made these are not home runs on buildings. Lloyd knows this. Many in here that have worked on buildings know this. You know, any architect that tells you that, you know, one thing that they put on the building to greenwash a building or stand out somehow or self-shade, you know, that's doing all the work is not telling you the truth. Um, and I'm, I'm here to tell you that it took all of this to just get you know, 16% and a half percent above that equivalent energy and to get up to EPA Part A and Part C, um, which were also uh, UK energy standards as well. And it took the chilled beams and underfloor air distribution, the air side economizers, the change setback, the heat recovery, the air cooled chillers, the ground source heat pumps. You know, I think, uh, I don't remember how many uh, wells we have on site, but I think it's over, I think it's 60 or 90 sites, uh, wells on site. Lighting density improvement, triple glazed I IGU that is thermally broken, never been done for the Department of State before. Um, thermally broken curtain wall, exterior shading, daylighting, and, and PV generation. And you can see that some of those, those things that, you know, give us all excitement are really the smallest pieces of the, the, the design you know, going forward up there. They're, they're relevant, they're important. I'm not ruling them out, we want them, but we have to do all these other things to these buildings to get there as well. And so you can't just cheap up all the other stuff and call it a day and then slap some things on a building and call it green. And it's, you know, it's, it's really important to think about that because that's where all in and in all comes into play is that you have to sit here and design with everything open and iterating it to get the right uh, chemistry of all of this to work. Part of it was, you know, understanding our impact. You know, our tally software was utilized on this building, you know, to lower our carbon uh, uh, choices, you know, in the building as well. We were forced by security requirements to either do a concrete or steel building. We had to do that. There was just nothing that can withstand the impact of some of the threats on this particular build, type of building, um, you know, in, an, in any other way. Um, a smaller building, CLT perhaps, but in this particular building, um, we fortunately were able to use steel because, you know, we, and composite floors because um, it enabled us to get out of the ground. So here it is completed, uh, the Thames busy, and here's how that, those images start to play on the light as it moves around the building. And some people call it the iceberg, you know, um, some, you know, call it the ice cube, um, some call it crystalline. 
but it changes throughout the day. And you can arrive there early in the morning, it can be quite golden. You can arrive there in the afternoon on a gray, overcast London day, and it's a chameleon. It changes into this very kind of cool, you know, uh, serene, uh, crystalline form. And that reflection is principally due to the, due to the ETFE foil, but it also is contributed to by the, by the, um, uh, the uh, ceramic fret on the, on the scrim. So here's how it all stands off. A BMU, a building management unit, can drop between, clean the glass, clean the ETFE, uh, and, and manage it, uh, an aerial view of the park. The triangle piece to the west uh, is for sale. So if you want to live there, you can put your house there. Um, or we can put the Canadian Embassy there. We'd like to have friends. Um, um, my, watch our backs. There are more housing going up around this. Um, as we cite. So, um, you know, it, as part of the unpacking of, of the project, I think, you know, too often architects show a lot of pretty pictures. I think this is a pretty picture. Um, it's not so pretty when you look at the logistics, um, but that is actually a very well managed site, believe it or not. Those are, the, those are both the caissons going in and the ground source water wells going in. Um, at that particular moment on the site, I think there were something like 30 vertical rigs on site. At the peak of the construction, we had over 1,000 workers on the site. And uh, at the peak of construction with all the other construction going on in Wandsworth, there were over 5,600 workers on all the sites in that sector of London at that particular time. Because you can imagine the logistics trying to get on and off the site. That's the core going up and this frame coming behind it. And then the glass going on. The laminated glass turns that very clear glass into a kind of gray green because the, you know, the more layers you add, the, you know, the, the more that color you know, begins to uh, layer up and add. But you can get a sense of those trays and the, and the, and the floors. Um, there's a you know, service area below, car park, mechanical spaces below, um, you know, all with basically a green roof, you know, with a landscape over the top of it. These are the struts going up and the initial ETFE being stretched. You can see the, the riggers clambering over the, top of, over the top of them. So the plan of it is, you know, nine elms, the green park, three points of entry, service to the southwest, Consular entry up through a consular garden uh, and a separate lobby. The main entrance plaza where the dignitaries and the most of this 800 staff come in from the east. North faces toward the pond and toward the Thames. We look across the pond. The United States looks across the pond to the UK. So we look across the pond to London uh, here. Uh, that garden, working with Olin, um, uses the flora that's been exchanged over many years between the U.S. and the U.K. Their, the, our sycamore trees or their London plane trees, for instance, you know, roses, thistles, other things in an ever-changing series of gardens. And then the American gardens are up through the building, six of them, three that open to the outside through the ETFE foil. Um, all connected by stairs, and you'll see them in a minute, um, that allow this embassy staff to walk up and walk down through the building. And each of those are, um, you know, a North American garden, uh, you know, depicting some landscape in the, in the United States. No other embassy it, it, that we know of in the world has a park that comes up this close to the embassy. I know the Ottawa uh, U.S. Embassy comes close. Um, but this literally comes up right to the pond, and you can walk or ride your bike right through here in this, uh, in this uh, seasonal garden. The um, bowling green is up at the top of the wall. The weirs help move the water, and here's a detail of that, uh, the garden coming in. Um, a view from the other side, Nine Elms Lane to your right. Uh, you can see the section of the site helps us, um, you know, with things like anti-climb. So 
no, we don't have any fences, but we were able to use site section, you know, to help us, you know, uh, meet the requirements of, of um, accessibility to the site. Uh, the uh, main entry CAC here, which also accepts vehicles uh, in, a, in a sally port. Uh, the consular entrance uh, coming up to the southeast, southwest side in the Bowling Green. There's art throughout the building, and you'll see one of those pieces of art going in, but this is Sean Scully's mural that we had imagined, you know, these artists wrapping the four walls of the core so you could see that from the park through the uh, lifted up cube, through the glass, this one to the outside. Part of that art is the American seal um, and the ambassador's names on the main entry wall. You walk in from outside, the pavement is granite on the outside, um, you know, comes in as a threshold, then turns to limestone and turns up the wall. Um, uh, limestone in this three-story lobby space that wraps around the north side with the Mark Bradford um, uh, depiction of the U.S. Constitution uh, there, uh, glass stair and glass bridge. Um, these are for events and gathering um, uh, throughout, uh, you know, shared uh, spaces. Opens to a meeting room that is divisible for a variety of presentations in the former ambassador's portraits on the lower wall. And then, you know, some of that art, this being Rachel Ritweed, a 1950s American house, flat packed on the wall out of precast, um, layered across the embassy uh, consular gallery. You, you get a ticket, you come in, your screen, you come in, you get a ticket. You then go up a series of elevators to the consular level uh, through that lobby right there, and you'll see that in just a minute. And then you arrive in this space, a two-story space with two different uh, consular sections on it, kind of serene, open, controlled. Um, th this used to be a room at the old embassy that was just a bunch of chairs thrown in it. Every day, the embassy staff would go back and put these chairs back just like this room. And by the end of the day, those chairs would be everywhere because you know, you've got kids and families with strollers and chaos and stress and everything else. We wanted to create a calm, serene space that was, um, that was you know, uh, acoustically controlled, that allowed the kids running room, you know, in the space. There are lounges at either end, um, but then you're called to a window, a teller window essentially, and a semi-soundproof booth to exchange your paperwork and do your business. Um, with the consular staff. And these chairs are, you know, sitting aside uh, rear illuminated lit walls that just give this overall glow uh, in the consular space um, and the detailing uh, of the building. The gardens, three of them open up to the outside. Um, this is the Pacific Northwest Garden. They have real plants in them and fictive plants. So the fictive plants are made out of, in this case, steel, perforated steel, depicting the, the um, redwoods of, of the Northwest, but the actual ferns and wood coming from that, wood floor coming from that region. The Southwest, uh, or the Coastal Garden, um, Gulf Coast Garden with you know, succulents and, and vines. Those vines will eventually take over the stair that connects the two floors and that overlooks the food service area. And then the bar up above with the food service area coming down another level here. Um, this is the Southwest Garden. Um, succulents, cacti, um, real, real plants with you know, light managed, both from the outside and the inside, irrigated uh, in this particular case. Corten steel depicting the kind of stone walls of the of the, uh, of the Southwest. And, you know, just, you know, interconnectivity. I mean, this gives you, you know, I wasn't lying to you when I said it's, a, it's an office building. Um, you know, what goes on in those offices is different than Goldman Sachs and, you know, the banks and everything else, but it's an office building. And so, you know, there are meeting spaces and places to connect. 
They never had anything like this before. They bring everybody here and they operate differently. They, many of these people that get posted here sometimes are coming through here after posting in some place like Pakistan or Iraq or you know, China or some other place and they come here and it's just like this vacation almost. It's serene, it's protected, it's, um, you know, it's you know, enjoyable. The core walls continue to form the art wall around you know, there's a substantial art collection and it's uh, displayed on all the core walls going around the building. This is just a view at one of the corner offices. You see glimpses to London through the ETFE. The ETFE is about 97% as clear as the, um, I'm almost done, uh, as, the, uh, as the glass. Um, but it provides framed views outside through the glass. And just a detail of the, of the embassy. This little video clip shows the embassy a kind of day in the life, um, but it's about Mark Bradford, um, the artist in the center there, um, putting, doing his canvases uh, of the Constitution. It, it, that work of art brings tears to my eyes every time I see it. You walk down the stairs, you walk across the, the glass bridge, it's a beautiful piece. And then lastly, a, a drone shot. Um, uh, going up the Thames over the London Eye, uh, past the uh, art, uh, art complex, um, past the Houses of Parliament, Big Ben, um, Lambeth on the left, uh, the um, Waterloo Bridge, Battersea Bridge, um, MI6, apartments, more apartments, more apartments, and yet more apartments. Um, and this just keeps going. I'm not going to narrate it. I'll just let you watch. You can, see, you can see the noise that we had to put up with. You can see all of the kind of, you know, look at me stuff going on with all of these towers and, you know, collage facades and everything else. You know, we wanted something that was stable, serene, dignified, present, lit, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, manageable, um, sustainable. Um, in 2022, roughly all those sites will be completed. Um, there will be about 25 to 30,000 new occupants in that whole zone. Some of the MSC staff have already taken apartments in that particular area. It's only a five-minute car ride. Uh, for the ambassador to 10 Downing Street, which was a distinct, you see the Shard, you see the financial district, you see Canary Wharf uh, off to the right there, the view of London. So, and just some Instagram shots, you know, it's in protests, it's in Love fests. It's in, um, you know, it's in a variety of different things. You know, it's become a, you know, kind of cultural stopping point. Uh, people have held up for sale signs. Um, uh, you know, this building's for sale. This the country is for sale. Um, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of stuff going on, but it, you know, it, it can support this kind of activity, and that's what those are there for. They're there for free speech, uh, and they're there for the purpose of you know, us being a diplomat of the environment and a, an environment for diplomacy. Thank you all very much. Before we hand over the floor to James to field some questions, a couple of notes. First off, we do have our next lecturer is gonna be Trevor Bowdy, sorry, Bodhi who's going to be here on October 22nd. Trevor is a, he's an award-winning consulting urban designer. So you please join us here October 22nd, 6.30 in the pit. I'd also like to call on some of our students who have a small token of our appreciation. Oh, gosh. I don't deserve it. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is just on behalf of our department. Uh, this is our 325 magazine. It's a yearly awesome. magazine we do. Uh, with all of our students' work. 
So thank you so like much. To give and your you a name copy. is Jessica. Jessica, mm -hmm. and your name? Thank you so much. Nicole, Nicole pleasure. Nice to meet you. Yeah, it was a thank great you. lecture. Thanks thank you very much. Me. Appreciate that. I'll open it later. I like the gold. I like the gold wrapping. Thank you. Thank you all very much. So, and because we're doing some taping, yeah. we're going to pass the microphone so that we can actually pick up the questions. So please, the if you want to just so. I'm gonna stick up your hand and it'll come to you. Perch on a stool here. So. so don't be shy. You can ask anything. Hi. Where are you? How did you get away? Oh, Hi. Hi. How did you, how did, thank you for the presentation. You're very welcome. So, how did you get away of having the buildings so close to the landscape? Uh, what I mean is, what are the aspects of passive security mm -hmm. That are hidden in the landscape mm -hmm. to to achieve the security levels required. Well, you know, and allowing you know, I'd have to lock you up. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I I think the easiest way to explain that is section, mm. site section. Okay. Um, there are a myriad of of things um, that we have to take into consideration for the, for the diplomatic security aspects of, of this building. Um, and uh, some of them are apparent in the aerial views, and some of them are apparent in the, in the, in the shots. Um, I'm not allowed to specifically talk about them. Um, but suffice it to say that um, the threats that we have to consider are um, uh, not only people-borne, but truck-borne, mm -hmm. vehicle-borne as well. And so um, because Nairobi and Dar es Salaam were not backpacks, they were, they were, um, they were attacks with vehicles uh, as well. And so uh, and you've had those incidents even up in Canada, sadly. And, um, and so there are distances that we have to, have to you know, think about um, that the embassy meets. Um, and then there are certain requirements about the materiality of the building that allow us to protect uh, the occupants. It's not about protecting the building. It is about protecting the people. You know, our assets in that building are not about information so much as it is about you know, we have visitors and we have diplomats and we don't want people hurt, you know, that are coming for embassy business. So all of those requirements were holistically brought into the design, not only by our landscape architects, but by ourselves through design devices that are common to your everyday design studios meaning through, through designing in section, through designing in plan, through designing, you know, and meeting the distance requirements and the, you know, you know climbing requirements and other kinds of things that we have to do. And they're just, they're, tr they're there. We tried to minimize the amount of bollards, and we buried the bollards that we had to have um, along Nine Elms into the landscape. Um, and you pass through that landscape so that the apparent aspect of bollards, you know, around the building are, are are minimized, but you know the walls have certain hardening capabilities and other kinds of things that keep us keep them all safe. Yes. Hi. Uh, I actually have probably three questions. Uh oh. It, it all relates to uh, this structure here. Okay. Um, when you were deciding to use this material. Um, what about um, maintaining, and also how do they clean the glass in yeah. behind? Yep. And let me take uh, what them one is the lifespan of, yeah. of, of this yeah, whole Yeah, let me take thing. them one at a time. So the lifespan of the ETFE is somewhere between 25 and 40 years. And basically, the, the lifespan of it is more about discoloration uh, than it is anything else. It remains fairly supple, and it um, doesn't get brittle. Um, because it's a tensionable material, so it, it's able to expand, um, and it occasionally has to be retention. Cleaning was thought about, that was thought about um, because we knew we were going to get that question, which we did from the jury. We also got the cleaning question from the jury, so very good. Um, the cleaning question was, you know, it's, 
as you saw in that one slide, it stands off from the building. There's a, a person uh, bucket, basically, that there's a crane on the roof, comes out of the roof, hangs over the side, allows us to make the drops in between the ETFE and the glass, allows them to clean the glass, it allows them to turn around and clean the ETFE on the inside faces of it. It's hydrophobic. So the outside of, uh, film generally keeps clean. We're seeing a little bit of deposit with all the construction work going on, a little bit of deposit near the rims on the horizontal rims. Um, and when the construction ends in 2022, um, they're probably going to have to get the riggers back out there and uh, do another exterior cleaning on the outside of the outside envelope. But it's able to be, be maintained. If it tears, it, um, it doesn't support um, fire. It um, it's, uh, doesn't support flame spread. And we proved that to the New York Fire Department when we did a cellophane house. Uh, so if you hold a match to it, it'll burn a hole in it, but it won't flame spread. Um, if it tears, it doesn't support, doesn't have ripstop material in it. But due to the nature of it, it doesn't continue to uh, transmit the tear. It'll tear. I mean, you can lacerate it. Um, but then we can take that off. That panel can come off and be retentioned in place. Um, and um, due to the BIM, you know, they, they would know exactly you know, how to replace that panel. So you had some additional questions. No, yeah. thank you. That's, that's, those are the three things okay. that I was asking. Thank you. Yeah. We have a question over here. Two over here, yeah. actually, or three. I think I'm going to start at the back and move forward. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I have two questions. Okay. One was that you had a, one of the slides that has many, many questions. Yes. And I think that that's, I think you were sort of explaining in terms of how you sort of, your office work. And some of the questions I actually read and was, I mean, they were great and uplifting questions. My, I guess my question to that is that how do you sort of bring in the clients with those questions? How, how do we how bring, do you in, bring the in the clients with that? Like, how do you explain that sort of method or yeah. sort of goals that the way you guys approach the project? Yeah. And then second question is, it's about this building and um, what do you think, like just sort of looking back on it, that got you to win the project competition? Um, that's a great question. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, so let me answer the first one first. Ours is a culture of inquiry. OK, so the whole notion of those questions just comes naturally to, came naturally to Steve and me as we started the firm 35 years ago. But as we built the firm, as we added Billy Faircloth, our design research director and now partner, as we've added staff, that culture of inquiry is encouraged along the way. But th that's also part of our process, which is we bring those questions to our clients. And we, we say, these are the questions that we're trying to unpack. And like the questions just a asked over there, or even your questions, or even the questions about security, those are normative questions that oftentimes clients would raise when they look at a design that is unusual, that you know, uh, is different. They want to understand how it operates, how what its life cycle is, how it's going to be maintained, um, how, how are we going to engage it, um, what does it look like? Those are the simplest parts of the questions. The deeper questions are, how is it going to perform? You know, how is it going to be an energy consumer? Is it going to be an energy you know, uh, exporter? Is it going to be? Is it going to be? Is it going to last 60 years or 100 years, or is it going to last 10 years? You know, we were barraged with all those questions by the Department of State as we were designing this building. But, so, I guess, these, are the, sorry, these are the type of projects that that's more expensive. <laughs> so no. I guess my no no no. How do you wh why do you think that? Because it's sort of not sort of, but it's based on sort of research based on no. 
Um, I disagree. And I tell you why I don't think, I think that's a false, that's a false assumption. Well, um, actually, I'm coming from a say, just say client's point of view that when you are sort of convincing something yeah. of a project, yeah. the sort of the, you know, the immediate answer or question is that, oh, that's going to cost too much. It's going to take more time and so forth. Okay, so let me unpack that for you for a second. And then I'll tell you why I think we were picked by the Department of State. Um, the very, one of the very first things any architect is handed is what? Is what? Huh? A what? What is one of the very first things that an architect is handed when they begin a project? And a budget, right? Every one of these were designed to a budget. We didn't ask for more money. And the Department of State side of this thing, so let me unpack it a little bit further. Department of State with Congress thing. The Congress was sitting there going, we want, we want money back. It's, it's costing too much money. Well, first of all, this was a real estate deal. We, the United States sold two properties in Mayfair that ended up providing for the construction costs of this project, the purchase of the land, the design fees, and the buying of the building and the furnishing of the building with no added monies provided by Congress. What Congress was trying to do was add, was trying to get money back from that deal and lower our budget because they didn't like us spending money on a building like this when all of this was designed holistically to basically be a zero sum game. So all of our buildings, all the buildings I've shown you today all had a budget and none of them were asked to increase that budget beyond what the brief was already asked. That first is one of the first acts of design is managing that budget. Where design inquiry comes into play, design research comes into play is helping us get to managing those kinds of things in the budget. So how do you get to a high performing building? Some, some of those ways can be by selecting, right? Selecting materials out of a catalog or systems. But those selections aren't necessarily always going to get you to the, necessarily the same place. Those questions were asked deeply about the mechanical system, about the systems put in this building, about the operations of the building, about management of the building, about all of those kinds of things in a give and take way with our client to understand how we could best you know, put together the best performing package of opportunities that were able to be maintained, meet the budget, and meet all of their brief pieces together. And that's all done through inquiry. That doesn't cost more. That is what every architect in this room needs to be doing. That is our, that are, that is not just makes us special. That should make us ordinary. So it's really, sorry, it's really important. I mean, it's an important question. It was a really good question. It's an, I'm not, and I don't want to seem like I'm lecturing you. I'm not. I, I, but it's a really important, I'm passionate about this. That's why it's coming across this way. And I just, I, you know, I, I think that I talk to students and faculty members about this all the time because I think too often the narrative out in the, work, out in the workplace or out in the, in the world is, oh, those buildings cost too much, or oh, Karen Timberlake's buildings must have you know, extraordinary budgets, or, or we can't afford to do that in our own office because um, you know, they were doing things so specially you know, this other way. Absolutely not. I mean, we couldn't do the blast requirements and some of the other things that we were required to do if we didn't fail early and fail fast and prove it to diplomatic security as well. So why were we, why were we chosen? I think we were chosen because we had the best scheme. And I think we were chosen because the Department of State looked at that scheme and realized that the other schemes were probably going to have to be redesigned to meet their brief. And I think the Department of State looked at us and said, they got this figured out. We, we like the building. The jury likes the building, mostly. Um, and let's prove and see whether or not this is the case. That building dimensionally only shifted about 
eight meters horizontally, vertically, you know, in, in three dimensions around the whole building. You know, once we went back through and unpacked and were challenged by things that were coming up in code, other code issues that we might have passed over or things that the Department of State were bringing up and everything else. I mean, we, we redesigned the core. The core had to get unpacked and repacked because we didn't have the core right, um, you know, because of the stair requirements in it and, and, some, and the elevator requirements and the separation of, of, of pass, pathway streams and everything else. But I don't think the other, the other three schemes would not have looked the way they looked. Ours did. And if you compare our, our, our scheme to the competition winning result, it's very, very close. Question right here. Hey. Hello. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Um, so site seems to be something, and then the kind of understanding of site is something that seems to be knitted, kind of integrated as a core piece of your, of your practice and of your, your kind of expression mm -hmm. of things. I'm wondering with the embassy building, knowing that the context in the site was going to be changing well beyond once your building went in, how that influenced A, the modeling of the performance, and then B, also your kind of expression of the yeah. site. Well, it was easy on both, to tell you the truth, um, because um, one of the things about London is you go through about six or seven different planning agencies. And I think it's, it's something missing from the United States. I don't know about Toronto. I know Toronto, I mean, we've been through reviews, you know, reviews up, up here. I think we've been through three or four different review agencies on the UTM project. Um, and I, I find those to be not um, issues that are conflicts. They are, uh, if handled properly, they are uh, professional exchanges to make your building better. Um, and the, unfortunately in the United States, they're ta taken as, as questioning authority or questioning uh, design you know, uh, sensibility. Um, and I think it's all wrong. We, we get it all wrong down there, um, among other things. Um, um, but the, so we knew the arc of where most of the height limits of the buildings and the footprint limits of most of those buildings around were. And we, we took those and modeled those and modeled those into our shading. And they aren't much different than the buildings that are going up. The buildings might have gotten shaped a little differently. They might have gotten slender on one side or another. But for the most part, they are either providing a certain amount of self-shading or permitting a certain amount of light to hit the embassy based upon the modeling that we did. As for their look, if you saw our model um, you know, of the presentation, we did two models um, over the course of eight months. Um, we have these sort of crystalline anonymous buildings kind of around that are masked up to the height and all of that. But we kind of knew based upon some of the names that were being bandied about uh, that were in those developer design teams, probably where their aesthetics were going to go. Um, Farrell's did you know, some of the ones near end of the embassy. Richard Rogers did the ones down. They were, they were kind of Tate Modern Light, I would call them, the ones that Richard Rogers did. Farrell's are this kind of brick and tile, ceramic tile collage with punched windows you know, with kind of snorkel, you know, snorkel tops. Um, so we knew that there would be some g general goofiness to the materiality, not so much goofiness to the forms, because when you start talking about residential towers, there's a kind of limit to the patterning and core. So yes, there are some round or elliptical towers. There are some oblong towers. They're, but they're mostly rectilinear, and they're mostly, you know, uh, probably six to ten times their height to, you know, to footprint proportion. We ch we chose to say contextually, there was no way we could map to that, and so ergo, why 
we chose the path we did on the materiality of the building that served more this, the, the performance of the building and served more an expression of the building independently, not of a building that was residential in character, but one that was of some other you know, character, but also not trying to express it as a corporate office tower um, either. You know? So I mean, that goes back to that whole goofy form conversation I had earlier about you know, when you're in London, you know, how do you compete with the walkie-talkie and the gherkin and the shard and the razor and the this and the that and all the, all the things that they're going to mislabel and, and cheekily label your building? Um, you know, ours was a the moment it was announced in the press it, it, at the competition winning moment when the ambassador noted, they immediately call it the flash cube, you know? Well, any of us remember, you know, the old Instamatic flash cube. We, we knew, that's one of the images we had up on the board. We knew we were going to be called that probably, you know, because we had done that research. You know, so you have to prepare yourself for this stuff. One of the things that Charles Moore said, interestingly enough, Charles Moore, the architect, you know, um, of the generation of Venturi and Guafi and all, all the rest, one of the things that he said that I remember reading in one of his books was, you have to pay for the public life. And you pay for that in a variety of different ways. You pay for it in reputation. You pay for it in slings and arrows. You pay for it in, in accord and accolade, right? Um, and um, if you're putting a building up like this, you have to be ready for that. And when we want... When we were doing this, that was a conversation I had with Steve going forward. I said, are you ready? Are you ready for this? Because you know damn well the press is going to be really hard on this thing. You know, it's the American Embassy. It's in London. There's a whole side of the uh, British press that hates our presence and hates what we're doing around the world. And I understand that. I hate it, too. Um, I just don't want him to take it out of my building. Um, <laughs> Um, but, but the point being is you have to be ready for that. And you have to have a sense of humor about it. And you have to be ready for it when you're designing it. Because if you're putting up a goofy form that you're not ready for, and they call it something, I'm going to tell you, if you've got thin skin, it's going to draw it out real fast. You know, So we were ready. Thank any, you all. Sorry. You know, any last question? <laughs> We are You're kind done? of over right, time. Dinner. I hate to break it <laughs> yeah. off. I'm right. sure Stephen would be much. happy to entertain a couple of questions. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks.